and welcome to the Nonfiction Authors Association webinar series. These webinars are carefully designed to teach you what you need to know about writing, publishing, and promoting your nonfiction books. Whether you're listening live or on one of our social channels like Facebook, YouTube, or Vimeo, turn up the volume, set your monitor to full screen mode, and prepare to immerse yourself in this valuable learning experience. Now on to the webinar. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for another complimentary webinar from the Nonfiction Authors Association. I'm Stephanie Chandler. I am CEO of the Nonfiction Authors Association. And we're talking about my favorite topic today, which is book marketing, how to build your book marketing plan. It is an extra special day because today my brand new book is also launching. I'm just going to show it off here briefly. The Nonfiction Book Marketing and Launch Plan just went live on Amazon today. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it at the end, but I just wanted to give a shout out and say it's here. It is a, an eight and a half by 11 workbook. As you can see, it is not a bunch of blank pages. It is full of actionable tips and advice, 250 plus pages, 50 plus exercises. I'm really proud of this book. I feel like it's some of my best work. So today I'm going to give you some of the tips and insights from the book. And we also have our book marketing master course launching next week. So stay with me for that. For those of you who are attending live, I'm going to take every question. I will stay as long as it takes today to answer all your questions. So please, if you have a question, put it in the Q&A. And for chats, you continue to chat amongst yourselves over on the chat. But for uh, questions, please put them in the Q&A. It is hard for me to get through all the chat for question time. So I will take questions at the end. We're also doing a giveaway today. Five live attendees are going to get a digital copy of the nonfiction book, Marketing and Launch Plan. So stay with me throughout. I promise to make this worth your time. This is a fun topic. And I really want you to leave this session today with some fresh new ideas for marketing your own books. So here we go. Benefits of building a platform. First of all, You've probably heard the word platform a million times, and you're probably sick of hearing the word platform, but really a platform is your audience. We achieve platform. Publishers want to see authors with platform. We achieve an audience either through website traffic, email subscribers, social media followers, doing a lot of speaking, maybe writing a national column. These are some of the many ways that you can build an audience. And it's not only important for traditional publishers, but it's important for you as an author, especially if you self-publish, because having an audience means that you have people who are going to want to buy your books. And so why do we want to do this? Having a platform, having an audience, whether it's your email subscribers, your social media following, a high traffic site, this leads to great opportunities. So we have obviously book sales, number one. The more people you have in your own community, the better. You're going to sell more books. But having a platform also means it's a whole lot easier to get a traditional book deal if that's one of your goals. Corporate sponsors will um, want to work with you, guaranteed. They'll want to reach your target audience if you have a good size audience. And for those of you nonfiction writers who are maybe doing consulting or speaking, um, teaching courses, things like that. Uh, building a platform is how we sell services and our books, right? And also it's a way to make a difference in the world. One of the things I love most about nonfiction is that it is a way for many of us who have a mission to make a difference, to reach more people, to share our stories, to offer valuable advice. I teach book marketing and publishing and this to me is a way to help other people live their purpose, which makes it feel really purposeful for me. So perhaps you have a mission or a purpose behind what you're doing and the bigger your audience, the better you can reach people. So step one in building your book marketing plan is getting clear about your audience. When I speak with new authors, typically one of my very first questions is who's your target audience? please be able to answer this question succinctly. Who are they? It is not everyone. Nobody, no book in the world is of interest to everyone. There is not a single book. 
So who is your target audience? Is it single moms? Is it uh, male business owners over the age of 50? Is it people who want to lose weight? Is it people who are going to read your memoir and get inspired by your journey? Do you have a memoir about maybe an illness that you've dealt with? Maybe it's other people who've had that illness. Maybe it's military history lovers. So whoever is your audience, you want to get really clear about that. And then we want to figure out what do they care about? Where do they spend their time? These are important things to understand so that you can figure out how to go and reach them. We want to know what associations do they belong to? What groups do they participate on Facebook? And then how can you serve them through valuable content? This is key. And I'm going to go through a whole bunch of examples for you today. I brought some really fun examples. So Melinda Emerson, she's a personal friend of mine. She built her platform using what is now known as X, but formerly Twitter. That is how she started. She started hosting small business chats, interviewing people in the small business space. Her audience built quickly and it created a whole career for her. She has a ton of corporate sponsors, lots of paid speaking gigs. She um, teaches for Drexel University. She has courses and consulting programs and all kinds of things. All of this because she started talking to her audience of small business owners and introducing them to other small business experts and concepts and tips that would help them grow their businesses. I have become a mega super fan of James Clear. If you haven't read Atomic Habits, this is a great time to read it, it being the new year. James Clear wrote this fabulous book, and really it could be called Atomic Goals. It's really about how to set and achieve goals through your daily habits. And it's been really interesting to watch how he's grown his platform through an email list. So he sends out one of the best email newsletters I've ever seen. It comes out, I believe, on Thursdays, and it is short and sweet. It usually has one quick tip, an inspiring quote, and um, he's just a brilliant marketer. So if you want to follow someone who's doing it really well, James Clear built his subscriber base to over a million subscribers. Now imagine if you have over a million email subscribers, are you going to get a book deal? Heck yeah. Are you going to sell a lot of books, even if you self-publish? Heck yeah. So building an email list is one of my favorite strategies as well. Shasta Nelson. I met Shasta maybe 10 years ago when I was speaking at the San Francisco Writers Conference, and she was there pitching her first book about women's friendship. And as soon as I met her, I knew she was going to do big things. She's very magnetic. And her topic was so interesting. And she had built a website called Girlfriend Circles. And it was almost like online dating for friendship. You know, as adults, it's harder and harder to make friends. So she had built a platform, a community of women who are interested in the topic of friendship. And then she expanded that to friendship in the workplace and started capturing corporate clients and speaking gigs. And I think just yesterday, she had an appearance on the Tamron Hall show and they came to her. She did not pitch them. She did not have a PR agent pitch them. They came to her because she has branded herself as America's friendship expert. You can do this same thing with your audience. I do not know Kevin of KevinMD.com, but I think what he's doing is really cool. He is, he calls himself social media's leading physician voice, and he writes content for fellow physicians has tens of thousands of uh, email subscribers, probably in the hundreds of thousands on social media. And he knows his target audience, it's fellow physicians. And he talks about physician life and patient care and things like that. Jenny Levine Fink, this lovely woman discovered she had a gluten allergy and she went through the painful process of eliminating gluten from her diet and she thought, I want to help other people do the same. So she built a website called goodforyouglutenfree.com. And this website offers up tips and recipes and articles. She has corporate sponsors because she has built a community of gluten-free, fellow gluten-free people. So imagine years after she has started this kind of advice website, her book comes out. 
it has consistently sold hundreds of copies every month as a result of building a community, a niche community of followers. My cousin introduced me to Julie Lithcott Hames, and I think she's another wonderful example of how to engage on social media. She um, is an advocate, uh, an, um, an activist. She's written a memoir. She has written several how-to books on raising kids and being an adult and living a good life. And I think she comes across as a magnetic person and she does some really cool stuff with live social media chats, answering people's questions who leave them on her, her Google phone hotline. Really fun person to follow, building a community online um, around, primarily around the topics of uh, relationships and parenting. And then Hal Elrod, he has been a professional keynote speaker for probably over 20 years now. Hal survived a head-on crash with a drunk driver, and he tells a really inspiring tale coming back from a traumatic brain injury. So for years, Hal was speaking, building a following online, building an audience, an email list of people who came to his speaking engagements. But it was like 15 years into his career before he got his book out. And look what's happened to that book. 32,000 reviews of a self-published book, my friends. So this is possible. He's built his audience through speaking. And I love this example of Michelle Zahner because this is a memoir. And those of you who are memoirists, I know it's you struggle with who is my target audience. Typically, it is often related to a theme in your book. However, not always. So Michelle Zahner is a singer. She's in a band. And so she has a following in her band. And then this fabulous memoir comes out. It gets lots of acclaim from critics. And she's got this built-in audience that no one like her and want to read her memoir. So that's another approach, building your audience maybe around a cause that you care about or something even loosely related to your book, like the city where it's set with travel advice or history about the city. Find a theme to build your audience around. What do these authors all have in common? They have built their audiences with various forms of content. I mentioned speaking, email marketing, social media. All of this is based on engaging an audience through compelling content. So I really believe and recommend that we all need at least one foundational piece of content. And by that, I mean, you pick one primary mode of content delivery. And in, today I think it's blog, podcast, or video. You wanna have somewhere to that your audience is landing and somewhere where you're producing new content fairly frequently. And then we take that and we share through our email marketing and social media. But neither of those can stand alone. You still want to bring people back to your website. And we do that either with a blog posts, podcast uh, episodes, or videos on our site because we want to be driving our own website traffic. Remember, remember that social media is rented real estate. So all those people who are popping on TikTok or Instagram, that's wonderful. But if those platforms ever decide to cancel them, they're done if they haven't also brought their audience back to their website, back to their email list. So other content strategies, getting the word out on social, of course, speaking is a big one. I always say speaker sell books, um, doing online events like we're doing right now. You are part of my community. That means a lot to me. So we do webinars. We're going to, we're committed to doing two a year this year. So you'll see lots more free events. You might also be teaching in-person events, posting on industry blogs and publications, just other ways that you're getting your content that serves your audience. Typically, that means teaching them something. You're getting that out into the world. So remember, it's all about that niche audience. Who do you want to reach and how do you offer them value? Teaching, being entertaining, how do you serve your audience so that they want more from you and they want to go buy your books? All right. So good news for those of you who are new and several people prior to us going live here 
so that they have books launching in the next couple of months. If you haven't yet started building your platform, I have good news for you. It's probably already bigger than you think it is. So I created this exercise uh, a few years back, and this is what I call your tribe of influence. Who do you know that could help support your book? This includes people that you maybe went to school with 30 years ago, former coworkers or neighbors or somebody that you coached your kids little league team with. Think about your networks and it going out by decades, because quite frankly, to the average person, you authoring a book is pretty amazing, right? Most people aren't going to accomplish this goal. And so they look at it as a really incredible accomplishment. And it is, by the way. Uh, but they're going to want to support you. And I always think about how I'm a Silicon Valley refugee. I left 20 years ago, but I still have connections with tons of my former coworkers, clients I sold software to back in the day. Um, you can bet if I was writing books for tech companies, I would be reaching out to those people. I would be asking them to get my books into their companies or bring me in to speak, doing things like that. This is an exercise that I personally do. Every time I release a book, I sit down and think about who do I know? Who haven't I connected with in a while? I go through my social media. I go through my emails because we forget when we haven't stayed in touch with people on a regular basis and we think about um, how we can reach out to them. So go through your contacts, right? This could be through alumni associations, trade associations you belong to. If you offer services, certainly your clients, your peers, these are all people that are part of your personal community that can help with book promotion in one form or another. So here are some of the ways that they might help you. They might publish an excerpt on their blog. Maybe they have a podcast and they can interview you for the podcast. Maybe they can connect you with speaking engagements or introduce you to some big name podcasters. Uh, maybe you can write guest articles on their site, or maybe you're simply asking them to buy the book and post a review on Amazon, because that's super valuable too. Um, but bulk purchases, selling to corporate clients, things like that. Look for these connections, and I will bet you, you're going to have some really good connections if you spend this time to go through this exercise. All right, next up, beta readers and launch teams. This is such a powerful concept to give early readers access to your manuscript before the rest of the world has access. And here's how they can help. Beta readers most traditionally are there to offer editorial advice. Maybe you want to get feedback. Is your manuscript coherent? Is it logical? Are there places that are confusing? Do you need somebody to do some spot check on the editing? All of these things can be considerations with beta readers. I personally really love connecting with beta readers for the support when launching a book, asking them to write the first reviews on Amazon, help having them put it out in their emails and their social media. So it's almost a two-part strategy. You may or may not want editorial feedback, and that is fine, but certainly they become your launch team and they help you get the word out to their audiences as well. Um, so these are the ways we're doing that. Word of mouth buzz is huge. When I launched my last book a couple of years ago, it was the first time I had worked with beta readers and I had put out a call for readers. I wanted a hundred. That was my goal. And I ended up getting 401 applications and I accepted 400 of them. One looked spammy. The rest of them I accepted. They 400 people got early access to the manuscript. Well, guess what happened when the book launched? I saw all kinds of social media engagement. I saw my beta readers buying the book, even though they didn't have to. So many of them bought the book and then ended up writing a review that had a verified purchase tag. So I just think this is such a fantastic way to get some early momentum with your book marketing. Now, I recommend you create an application. You don't want to just give your manuscript out willy-nilly. You want to um, round up some people who are interested in your genre. Very important. I would not be a beta reader probably for historical romance. It's not a genre I read, but you want to find beta readers who are interested in your genre. And you want to look to, again, your contacts, people you know, associations you belong to. For those of you who are members of the Nonfiction Authors Association, we have a private Facebook group. I encourage you to put out 
calls for beta readers there um, because your fellow authors, especially if you're interested in the same genres or even writing for the same genres, you can support each other. So you can create an application with a free Google form, really easy to do. And then you want to organize your group. When I had 400 beta readers, it was a lot. So we created a Facebook group, of course, um, an email list so I could communicate with them. Uh, you can share your files. We really like bookfunnel.com. We are not paid to say that, but I use it as a tool. So bookfunnel allows you to distribute your manuscript securely. You could also make it available in a Dropbox, just not quite as secure, but just show gratitude because you're offering them a, a value of getting to be the first to read an early book, but it's also a value to you when they're supporting your endeavor. And I also want to remind you, because I know this question is coming in right now, but what if somebody steals my work or what if they pass my manuscript around? We asked Seth Godin this at the, uh, I think it was maybe the 2013 Nonfiction Writers Conference. He spoke for us. And I said, I hear from a lot of authors that they're afraid their work is going to get pirated or shared for free. And I loved his response. He said, your problem is not piracy. Your problem is obscurity. If you read Seth Godin, he's a marketing guru. He's got some wonderful books. And his philosophy is get your manuscript and your book into the hands of as many readers as possible. Yes, even if you're doing it for free. It's, don't view it as a lost sale because anytime somebody likes a book or even a restaurant, you're likely to go and tell friends, hey, I went to this restaurant. It was really great. Hey, I read this book. It was really great. You're going to love it. So that's one of the many reasons you want as many eyeballs as you can get on your work by sharing it often um, and as much as possible. All right. So let's talk about preparing to launch your book. Tons of content is needed. I am here on a book launch day. Today is the, the launch for the nonfiction book marketing and launch plan. I did all these things, right? Pre-wrote tons of content. I sent out emails to my friends, my peers, um, my beta readers, my members of the Nonfiction Authors Association, plus our entire subscriber base. You've probably gotten a lot of emails from us in the last week. My apologies. We don't typically do that. Um, but it, it, it's important to do this around a book launch. So you'll want to plan ahead and not be doing this at the last minute. So I try to pre-write as much content as possible. And yes, don't worry, you are going to get a copy of these slides. You don't need to be frantically writing this down, although you could also take a picture with your phone if you wanted to. But we will send out a copy of the slides with the recording later today. Review copies of your book. So this gets back to getting your book in the hands of as many people as possible. Um, I challenge you to send out dozens of review copies of your book. Dozens, yes. Maybe even a hundred or more. And really the reason is to get that buzz going. You want to send your book out to peers and influencers in your field. You want to send it if you're trying to get interviewed for any kind of media you want to certainly send copies to those mentioned in the book. Anyone who's going to help you promote the book or is interviewing you for their podcast. I just did a podcast interview day before yesterday with David Newman. He wrote Do It Marketing and he's got a, a podcast. And I was praying he got the book before the podcast because we had some delays with delivery. But thankfully he did. So he was able to actually see the book, hold it, read it before we conducted this really fun interview. So you wanna make sure that you're getting those copies out to people. And you can also offer the digital copy, of course, but I like to give people the option. If you'd also like the physical copy, let us know, we'll pop one in the mail for you. And then launch day. So you're sending tons of emails, you're posting on social, you are, by now, hopefully you've claimed the book on Amazon Author Central. That's really important. That's a free tool for authors. I think it's author.amazon.com where you claim your book and you can update your book's content on your Amazon page. You might do a webinar like I'm doing right now. You might do a Facebook Live to get your uh, community engaged. And then, of course, you want to be monitoring your sales throughout the day, checking your category rankings on Amazon, capturing that with screenshots, checking in with your audience, sending thank you emails. It's a lot. It's a really fun day. 
All right. So Amazon is the super important part of your marketing strategy. So let's talk about some important things you need to know. Categories are huge on Amazon. Now, my book that I'm launching today has been up for pre-sale for a few weeks. So it has been a number one new release in five categories. And that's between the print and the Kindle edition. And it's been there for a couple of weeks, which has been super fun. Now, is there value in being at the top of a category on an ongoing basis? Absolutely. Is there a value in being at the top of the category for a few weeks? Absolutely. This is discoverability. This is how people find your book. What I don't love are those Amazon bestseller campaigns where you aim to be at the top of a category for a hot minute and then you call yourself a bestselling author. Not a fan. There really is no long-term value of being at the top of a category for a minute or a day. I would challenge you to aim to be in the top 10 of one or more categories on an ongoing basis. This is why we work to build a platform because it's great to be here. And I love being in the top of the new releases. It will not stay there forever. So my challenge as an author is to continue marketing the book so that it at least hovers in the top 10 of one or more categories because that helps with discoverability. So Amazon recently changed some of their category policies. It was very disappointing. You used to be able to ask for 10 categories. They have now limited it to, you can ask for three categories for your books, for each edition. Your paperback can have different categories than your hardcover can have different categories than your Kindle can have different categories than your audiobook. So you can request Amazon, add your book to specific categories. So I recommend do your research. That means getting on Amazon, looking at similar books, looking at what categories they're listed in. The narrower the category, the easier it is to get to the top of it. So that is something to keep in mind. I also love the tool Publisher Rocket. It is a paid tool, not an affiliate link, but Publisher Rocket by Dave Cheston is a tool where it will help you locate and assess the competitiveness of Amazon categories. So it's a worthy investment and it's pretty inexpensive. It's, I forget how much now, but it's under a hundred dollars for sure. So you would email Author Central, Amazon Author Central support with a list of the categories for each of your books. And they usually make those updates within a couple of days. And book reviews on Amazon are so important. And if you've been an author for a while, you know they are not easy to get. I think we all have good intentions, but um, book reviews, people will say, oh yeah, I'm going to write a review, but they forget, right? And so we have to remind and we have to ask and all of those things. So I like to say, post on social, one of the best ways to thank an author is to write a review on Amazon because book reviews also help readers decide to buy a book, but they tell Amazon your book is popular. And there's some theories around, you know, if you hit 50 or 75 or hundred book reviews, Amazon starts promoting your book more on its own. That's probably true, but we don't know exactly because Amazon doesn't publish that information. But the point is we should all be working on an ongoing basis to get book reviews. And I received an email from a reader of my last book uh, earlier this week, and he sent a lovely email thanking me for the book. And my response was, thank you so much for taking time to send me this. By the way, if you haven't yet, would you please post a quick review on Amazon? And I shared the link. It just made it super easy. So get in the habit of asking for reviews. Book Review Targeter Software is another paid service, but I love this. It goes out looking at your competing titles and it rounds up a list of Amazon reviewers who make their email addresses public so that you can contact them and offer them a review copy. These are people who are actively reviewing your competitors' books on Amazon. So uh, it's called Book Review Targeter and it's very cool. All right, some more Amazon tips and I am gonna take your questions. So please pop them in the Q&A. We're gonna get there soon. More Amazon tips. You want a really keyword rich book description. So think about what are people searching for when they're looking for a book like yours? Is it a memoir about running marathons? Is it a book about how to invest in real estate? 
Is it a book about how to care for aging dogs, right? So you want to work those key phrases into the book description because that helps Amazon know what it's about and it helps readers know what it's about. I mentioned claim your book on Author Central. Amazon lets you do that as soon as the book is live on Amazon. You go to author.amazon.com. You create a free Author Central account. You claim your books and then you can update the content on your book's sales page. Really important. And driving sales to Amazon. I would say most of us in publishing have a love-hate relationship with Amazon. It's just a fact. They are a beast. They are not easy to work with for a number of reasons. However, some people are estimating as many as 70% of all book sales are happening on Amazon. It is just where people are buying their books. It's a good idea to point your buyers to buy your book on Amazon. It's just going to help sales beget sales. So the more sales you're generating on Amazon, the more Amazon is incented to cross promote your book with other books. Utilize Amazon ads. That's a whole other hour long discussion in itself. But I will say, especially in the nonfiction space, Amazon ads can be really powerful. If you have a niche audience and you're really clear about who they are, Amazon ads are something worth uh, learning about. We share, we have a free report on them and a lot of information at nonfictionauthorsassociation.com. And then I just can't emphasize it enough. Reviews, reviews, reviews. Get more reviews for your book. I don't care if it's five years old. We always want to be on working to get more reviews of our books. So here's a fun case study. This is Mark Paul. He wrote a memoir called The Greatest Gambling Story Ever Told. And it is about him placing a bet on a Philly, a long shot bet on a Philly to win the Kentucky Derby. This was back in the 80s. And she ends up winning and he has to go collect his seven figure prize from the Mexican drug cartel. It's a great memoir. It reads like a, a novel, which is what memoirs should do. And so when Mark came about, he said, I have no audience. I don't want to do social media. This is not my thing. I'm going to go all out on Amazon ads. And I said, great. So he was able to uh, dominate in a number of categories. There's categories for books about gambling. There's categories for books about horses. He just dominated there and he invested heavily in Amazon ads and sold 20,000 books in the first six months. Um, and I think it's been three years now, 45,000 copies sold. He's up to 2,900 reviews. And remember, I talked about staying at the top 10 of a category. He is consistently in the top of uh, at least two categories at all times because he has really figured out how to make those Amazon ads perform for him. And then what happens is he's getting more readers. And guess what? Readers tell their friends, go get the book. So then it starts to organically build um, momentum outside of those ads. So it's not just ads driving those sales anymore. It's readers talking about it and writing reviews. Very cool. It also got option for film, by the way. Very cool story. All right. So here's how you're going to keep your momentum going with your book marketing. Email list. I can't emphasize enough. I think every single author needs an email list. Social media is rented real estate. An email list is data that you own. You may rent the platform that you send out emails on. It might be MailChimp or Constant Contact or Aweber. That's fine. But the content in that list, the subscribers are technically an asset that you own. They cannot take that away from you. And so an email is a captive audience. Many of you are here because you got an email inviting you to this event today, right? So I just can't emphasize enough how important I think it is to grow your email list. You want to give incentives. Lots of authors give a first chapter. That's fine. I challenge you to get creative and have multiple incentives. You know, we have a freebies page and nonfiction writers, nonfiction authors association.com where there's multiple reports. So if you don't like this report about how to sell your book to libraries, maybe you will like the book on steps to self-publish your book. And then you download that, you get great free content tailored to you, our niche audience, and we collect your email address. So think about incentives that you can give for people to sign up for your emails. Podcasts are hotter than ever. I think this is a wonderful opportunity and underutilized by many authors. 
So, I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of podcasts at this point covering everything from how to sell on eBay to how to live a gluten-free life to parenting, to politics, to business, you name it, spirituality, it's there. There's podcasts covering it and many of them need guests. Um, they promote the guests before and after the appearance. They typically interview you for 15 minutes up to a full hour. Whereas if you're on traditional radio, you might get interviewed for five or eight minutes max. That's very common on traditional radio. So I think podcasts live on and they tend to have their niche subscriber audience members. And if you're targeting your audience and that podcast reaches that target audience, that is a huge win for both of you, right? So you want to define your podcast topics put together a pitch. What value can you bring to that audience? It's all about the content. It's about teaching them, educating them, and entertaining them. And then you want to research shows. You can do this by going to Spotify or iTunes and doing keyword searches to find shows, or you can subscribe to a podcast database. There's tons of them now. I listed here Podmatch, Podseeker, Matchmaker.fm. There's a ton of them. And they're all pretty inexpensive, like maybe $20 a month. And it will save you a lot of time in doing that research. So you might want to consider that as well. But you want to send out your pitches and then prepare, prepare to be a great guest, prepare your answers, make sure you have the right equipment, right? So I'm coming at you on a Yeti, Blue Yeti microphone right now. I have lighting. Um, lighting is the key to lots of things. It will make you look a little younger, a little thinner, a little happier. So get some good lighting and elevate your video camera. I am not looking down. I am looking straight ahead into my camera that is on a flexible tripod that's clipped to my desk. So I take it off and on when I do these events and I'm not looking too far up. I'm not looking too far down. I'm trying to look straight ahead. So this is your goal. You want to get the right equipment. It's all relatively inexpensive Laptop cameras and mics, usually it's too far away for the microphone to be really great. And unless it's a brand new laptop, some of those older laptops don't have great cameras. I really recommend investing in maybe a Logitech webcam. You can find a decent one for $30 or $40. All right, professional speaking, speakers sell books. So whether you speak for free or you want to get paid to speak, this is an awesome way to market your books. I am speaking right now. I am doing a webinar. So put together presentations and start locally. Go speak at your service organizations like the Rotary Club or Kiwanis, your chambers of commerce, any local trade association, schools, uh, spiritual um, houses of worship, things like that. All of these are potential opportunities provided they reach your target audience. Here's another great real life example. This is Charmaine Ham Hammond. She wrote a memoir about her dog. And I love this. She's a bit business professional. She was really smart. She did that tribe of influence exercise where she thought about who do I know and how can they help me? And she planned an actual road tour where she got a local RV company to loan her a free RV. This went on for several weeks. I believe maybe it was a month long tour. Then she got a local vehicle wrap company to wrap it for her. And then she got tons of sponsors to provide everything from dog food to the coffee she had on the tour. She got hotel rooms, so she wasn't always sleeping in an RV. And she reached out to her, her tribe of influence and said, hey, can you book me to speak? I'm coming to your town on these dates. She spoke at pet food stores. She spoke in office conference rooms. She spoke in all kinds of unusual places, all by reaching out to her community and having asking them to help her connect. In the end, 10,000 miles, she had 40 sponsors. Look, they're all listed on that wrap who gave her all kinds of products and services that she promoted during her tour. And she sold, I, I think, thousands of books through that program. It was really amazing. Speaker sell books. All right. So at this point, you're probably totally overwhelmed and you're like, why did I come to this webinar? Stephanie's crazy. This is so much work. <laughs> right? And it is. It's a lot of work. I'm not going to tell you it's easy. I don't have an easy button for book marketing. I wish I did. Believe me, if I did, 
I would give it to you all day long. It doesn't exist. So here's what I'd like to say. We talked at the beginning about the benefits of building a platform, creating book sales, creating other like opportunities to speak and maybe sell consulting services. So if you want to do those things and reach those goals, you've got to put in the work. If you don't, if your book is a passion project, if it is something that you are doing for fun, can half of what I just said and do the things that sound like fun to you and accept that your book sales aren't going to be astronomical. And that is okay. Not every book needs to sell thousands of copies. That is okay. So you get to decide how you want to set your goals and how much work you really want to do. So I'm a big believer in hiring help. I, I often say successful authors don't do this alone, right? And New York Times bestselling authors have day jobs, but they also hire virtual assistants. A virtual assistant is somebody who is a virtual administrative professional that you can hire for as few as five hours a month to help you research and send out podcast pitches or speaking pitches or send out your review copies or help with your social media and your blogging. And they you, you might pay anywhere from 20 to $80 an hour, depending on their experience. But if you put a hundred or $200 a month toward hiring an experienced virtual assistant that especially handles the tasks you don't want to do or you procrastinate about, it will change the game for you. Promise. All right. And then lastly, we're going to wrap up and take your questions. But marketing, I view it like gardening, right? So I absolutely hate gardening. And if we were live, I'd say, how many of you don't like gardening, right? And about half the hands in the room would go up. And, and then I would say, how many of you don't like book marketing? And about half the hands in the room go up. But here's the thing. I garden in my yard because I love the end result, not because I love dirt. I actually really hate dirt. I am squeamish with bugs. I don't like the heat. I live in Sacramento. It's really hot. Uh, but I love having a beautiful yard. So I do it. Marketing is, can be the same. If you don't enjoy it, but you want to reap the rewards, imagine if you were to walk out in your garden and plant three seeds every day. If you just watered and planted three seeds every day, your garden would grow. Now, three seeds when it comes to book marketing might be writing a blog post, sending a podcast pitch, mailing out a review copy, right? Could you do three things a day to market your books? This is doable. I promise you. All right. Whew. I know that was a lot. I went through that quickly. I am going to share the recording. I am going to share the slides. These will be shared. I want to take your questions. We're also going to do a giveaway. So for those of you who are here live, stay with me. We're going to do a giveaway after we take questions. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and look to see if someone else has already put the question there. So we're, we're not having too many duplicates. That would be helpful. Um, but before we do that, please indulge me for two minutes because I want to share with you today is my book launch day. So um, I'm practicing what I preach, right? I am launching a book today called The Nonfiction Book Marketing and Launch Plan. It is a workbook. It is a 254 page workbook, but it's not full of a bunch of blank pages. It reads like a book. It has 50 actionable exercises that you can do to build your marketing plan, expanding on what we talked about today and much, much more. I put a QR code up in case you wanna get your camera out and click the link, it'll take you to the page. Um, but it's also at our site, nonfictionauthorsassociation.com slash book. And you can find it on Amazon. It's shipping as of today. I'm so proud of this book. I feel like it's some of my best work ever. If you want to sell more books, if you want to plan, I have it here. It is eight and a half by 11. It's big. It is loaded with content. I'm very, very proud of it. And I think it would be a really inexpensive investment in helping you sell more books. And lastly, before I take your questions, I just wanted to share with you next week, January 18th, we are um, hosting the book marketing master course. I only teach this live once a year, one time a year in January, every year. I think this is year four. And it is a six week program that will take you through all of these topics in great depth. I have so much fun. This is like the highlight of my year to teach this course every year. We do it all on Zoom. So it'll be Thursdays at 10 a.m. Pacific, the same hour we're doing this event right now. 
Uh, we will mail you a copy of the brand new workbook. So you'll get that in the mail. If you're in the US, international, we will send you the digital copy. Um, but we do uh, weekly Zoom calls. We do tons of Q&A. We have a private Facebook group for attendees. And I get to know all of you. And I get to know about what you're doing. We brainstorm ideas individually for attendees. It is so much fun. And there, I always have 100% guaranteed satisfaction on anything we do. So if after the first week you say this course isn't for you, we will give you a full refund totally without questions asked. Knock on wood, that's never happened, but it might. And if you're that person, we will give you that refund. So just quickly, the this is the weekly schedule. It's a six-week course, about 90 minutes a week um, at this 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern hour. So we do, the first week is own your niche. It's really digging in to understand who is your target audience and how do you serve them. Week two, we talk about your author website. How do you really elevate that to impress your visitors and sell books? We talk about your blog strategy, your social media. Week three, we're talking about your beta readers, your launch team, all those pre-launch tasks, the copy you need to write. We have sample letters that you need to write. All of those things are done in week three. And week four, we talk about how to be your own publicist. How do you go out and get booked on podcasts and radio and get interviewed by your local newspaper or national magazines or all of those things, television shows. So we go through online and traditional publicity. Week five is all about Amazon. So we're going to teach you how to master Amazon. We do cover the basics of Amazon ads. We talk about Author Central, how to optimize your book page, categories, all the nitty gritty and then in week six, we go through all those kind of advanced strategies, how to speak, how to host webinars, how to do these types of things that will keep the momentum going for your book. We also have an optional professional certification. So if you're attending today and you are a publishing industry uh, professional, you're a marketing assistant, you're a book coach, you're a ghostwriter, an editor, um, we have professional certification for book marketing book publishing and book publicity. And I'm so excited to bring this program. We're getting great results with the people who participate in the program. And once you pass six quizzes, we list you under recommended resources on our site. And literally the resources we have listed, they're all booked up. We need more resources. So this is an optional program that you can enroll in if you're a publishing industry professional or wannabe. Now, this morning, the direct link bookmarketingmastercourse.com wasn't working. Carla, if you're still there, maybe you can test it for some reason. The domain forward wasn't working. So it's a big, long, ugly link here. Or you can use your phone, capture that QR code. Or you can go to nonfictionauthorsassociation.com and find it there. Or you can go to Amazon um, for the book. Or if you want to enroll in the course, you can email help at nonfictionauthorsassociation.com and we will do that for you. If you're a member of the Nonfiction Authors Association, you always get 33% off our courses for authority and VIP members. Thought Leader members attend for free. So all you need to do is request enrollment. And if you're not a member, you can join when you enroll in the course. So I would love to see you there. This course is so much fun. I love hearing about what our community members are up to. Okay, now I am so ready to take your questions. I'm going to leave this up for just a moment, but I'm going to take it off in a minute here. But let me just get started on your questions. Mary Davis, what do you think are the best AI tools to make an audiobook? Mary, those tools are really evolving. I'm actually going to love that to Carla King. She's kind of our resident AI person. Personally, I would not create my audiobook with AI tools, but I know they exist. I really want inflection. I would want to either do it myself or hire someone who sounds like me to do it. So AI is still relatively new, although I do know Carla's been talking about services that do it. Maybe Carla, you can share the answer uh, for Mary. Judy, I am currently working on a children's fiction, nonfiction book. How do you market it? Well, Judy, this came in early. So hopefully you've gotten some ideas. A children's book I mean, it, again, it comes back to your target audience and the theme. How do you serve that audience? Is your book about manners for kids? Could you be the children's manners expert, right? So what is the theme of your book or your books that you can tie in to start building that audience? 
Uh, Alex, any specific advice about the marketing of biographies, particularly a biography about a famous singer songwriter? Yeah. So especially for someone who's famous, right? It sounds like maybe this is a family member or someone when you've written the book, you still want to build the platform around that person, particularly if they're famous. So that means the website, that means content, maybe quoting that person, video clips of that person. If they're no longer living, maybe it's pulling up some of their legacy content, but you still need to know who the target audience is. Famous singer, songwriter, what music genres do they listen to now? What are the other artists they like and how can you reach them? So hopefully that's uh, ringing a bell. Okay, I'm going to stop the share. Hopefully you've captured this by now so that I can... I can be back on screen here and you can see I'm really here. I am not AI. Cheryl, Substack is becoming more popular as a newsletter platform. Do you have any insights about using Substack? Yeah, Cheryl, Substack is definitely interesting. It is definitely working for a lot of people. My feeling about tools like that is that I never want to put my work on rented real estate. So you might do that in tandem with your own email address or email service off your website, but I wouldn't rely on it solely because it's still relatively new. We don't know where it'll be in, in a year or three years. It's sometimes these technologies disappear. So I would say it's very cool and interesting right now though. Christy, any thoughts on using Substack as a blog? So same answer, Christy, put your blog on your own website, please. I think you can certainly share your content on other platforms. You can put it on Substack, you can put it on Medium, you can put it on other websites. Here's a tip though, don't put your duplicate content on any other site for at least 30 days because Google does not like du duplicate content. So when you post a new blog post on your site, let it live on your site for at least 30 days and then you can go post it on Substack or Medium or your LinkedIn or whatever, put the full article out in other places but you want it first indexed by Google. I hope that makes sense. Nava, what should come first, beta readers or sensitivity editing? Ooh, good one. So editing in general is so essential. It depends on how you want to leverage beta readers. I would say sensitivity editing probably should be done before beta readers. And generally, you've had some level of editing before you go to beta readers. So most of us need multiple levels of editing, myself included. Uh, developmental is the most intense level of editing. It's where an editor really can potentially rework your manuscript. There's copy editing, which is line by line. And it comments like, oh, you covered this in the last chapter. Some really detailed feedback. I always put my manuscripts through a copy edit, one or two. And then there's the final proofread which is grammar, spelling, punctuation. And I usually go through a couple rounds of proofreading with different editors because it is a human function. And so with sensitivity editing, I'm assuming you mean you're going to hire an editor that specializes in sensitivity, which would be a brilliant thing to do. The Editorial Freelancers Association, by the way, they're a sponsor of the Nonfiction Authors Association, but you can pull it out a call for editors there and find someone specializing in that. So I would probably do that first and then beta readers. Sonia, how did you find so many beta readers? Well, Sonia, I have a platform. So I've been building my community for years. We literally have tens of thousands in this author community. So as you build your community, it'll be easier to find beta readers. But in the meantime, go out to social media groups, trade associations you belong to, email friends, peers, people in your target audience. And you can absolutely, I bet any one of you could get at least 100 beta, review, beta readers. Hugh, will Own Your Niche be available for Kindle? Amazon says it's not. Hey, Hugh, thanks for asking about one of my older books. I We actually had to take it off Kindle because it's such an old book. A lot of the links need to be updated and it just hasn't been a priority. So unfortunately, not at this time. I do hope to update that book soon, but a lot of the concepts are still super relevant. But unfortunately, we, there's a ton of links and not all of them work because guess what? Technology disappears. Remember that thing about Substack? It doesn't always stay. So unfortunately, that's why it's not on Kindle. And I apologize. <laughs> hey, Stuart, I worked with beta readers before and didn't feel their critiques were honest. Well, you've got to then maybe be really uh, picky about your beta readers. Stephen King said he only uses one reader for his book. It's one 
personal friend who gives him honest feedback and doesn't blow smoke up his shirt. <laughs> so you want to make sure that you're finding, even if it's just one or two people that give you really valuable feedback, that can be better than a hundred people that don't give you great feedback. Beta readers, do they get a PDF of the manuscript? What form of the book? How much time before the launch? So it depends on how you want them to access the content. You might even use a tool like a beta readers tool if you want them doing edits and putting edits in the manuscript. You could do that in a shared Google Doc. You could do that in a Word Doc. Or they can, if people have the ability to edit a PDF, they can. Or what most of us do is you would send a separate kind of a worksheet for them to note their edits and changes. And I mentioned BookFunnel. We deliver the files like this through BookFunnel and sometimes through Dropbox as well. And then as far as editing, beta readers editing are going to come way before your launch because you need time to finish incorporating the edits, get the book typeset, get it out. So that's probably six or more months prior to the launch. If you're doing this for book promotion support, you're probably closer to maybe two months you don't want them forgetting about the book either. Read. I find half my avatar group is anti-Facebook. What other group apps might work? It depends on who your audience is, Read. So there's all kinds of data around each of the social media networks and who's spending time there. So for example, if you're targeting a business audience, LinkedIn is your tribe, right? If you're targeting a younger audience, TikTok is your community. So it really depends on who they are and you can find that data easily online. Mary, do you recommend that authors create an LLC company with a DBA? So Mary, I love this question. This is a, a question about should you establish a business entity? I am not a lawyer or an attorney that's or, or a, an accountant. So let me give that caveat. This will protect your business if you're, especially if you're giving advice, you might also look into publisher's insurance. So this is a very different answer depending on what you're doing. But the fact is, if you've published a book, you're an entrepreneur, whether you're not. And by default, you're a sole proprietor. And so that means that you can claim a lot of your expenses on your taxes. So that all the fees you spent to produce your book and the marketing and the subscribing and the memberships and the courses that you take, hint, hint can potentially be write-offs, talk to your accountant. So, um, and you can do that even if it's just, if you don't have an LLC. An LLC is an added level of legal protection. So we have definitely covered this topic before. In fact, we did a webinar about it last month. That's not yet on the site, but it will be. But if you search nonfictionauthorsassociation.com, you'll find more. I know we're about to run out of time and I am committed to staying to take questions. But here's the thing, I wanna do our giveaway. for So for those of you that need to go, you can go. So here's what I'm going to do. I am going to just randomly scroll through. I'm going to close my eyes and randomly scroll through the attendee list that I see on my screen. And I'm going to call you out. And if I call your name, I want you to private message me through the chat, send it only to host with your email address, and we will send you the book. Okay. So here we go. I am scrolling and I am going to Angela Sutton. You are winner number one. I am scrolling winner number two. Daria Astara, I hope I'm saying that right. Winner number three, Heather, Heather Quist. And winner number four, Judy Jordan. All the ladies are winning today. Judy Jordan, please send me your email address by, pri by private message here on the chat. And our final winner, Shana Kaufman. All right, all right. So thank you all so much. I will send you winners the um, digital book. Send me your email address in the private chat here. And for the rest of you, thank you for being here. I'm going to stay if you can stay with us and go through all the questions. Let's do it. And if you can't stay, I completely understand. Oh, peace out. Have a great day. Go buy the book. Maybe come to my course. And we will send the slides and the recording out later today. So let's continue with questions. Debbie, I created a basic author website with WordPress. I find the blog and email list functions are hard to use. It's a lot to learn. What advice resources can you recommend hiring help for building an effective website? There's lots of great web designers out there. We have some on under recommended resources at nonfictionauthorsassociation.com. There's also some really great tutorials on YouTube. That's often where I go when I want to quickly learn how to do something. 
or hire an expert. I love to do this. Hire an experienced web person for an hour and have them walk you through it. Or look for a course maybe over on lynda.com or one of the learning sites have easy WordPress courses and things like that. But so many resources on WordPress. And once you learn it, Debbie, it will seem a lot easier. It's really not as complicated as it seems at first. Now, uh, is it better to send copies for review all at once or better to paste them 10 to 20 a month to keep exposure going? You know, I mean, it, it depends on your goal for those review copies. So I work with an author who's a consultant and he sends out 50 copies of his book every month to prospective clients. I think this is genius, right? It's a wonderful way to build a business, maybe to get speaking engagements. So if you're doing it for something like that, you might want to stagger them. But sending copies out and then you have a reason to follow up after is another um, reason to do it. And also don't send out review copies to people who aren't your target audience. Like people send me books all the time and I thank you. I love receiving them. But nine times out of 10, it's not a genre I read. I don't review books, period. I just don't. If it's a publishing industry related, I'm interested because we do bring in speakers and things like that. But make sure you're sending books to people who will potentially be the right audience for the book. Glenda, when do you see pre-sales beginning and ending relative to the release and launch? There's varying um, schools of thought on book pre-sales. They're not my favorite. I did one this time with this book primarily because I was so anxious to start talking about it that I put it up for pre-sale. Um, I think we had a maybe a three-week lead time. I mean, the longer it's in pre-sale and you're able to keep the promotion happening and you're staying in the top of new releases of categories, that's great. If you've got a pretty good community and you can keep that going, maybe a month is a good lead time. If you have, a, I've seen authors do six month leads. I've seen authors do one week. So it really depends on the size of your audience. I wouldn't do a long lead time if you don't have a very big audience. Uh, Mary, good approach to choosing Amazon categories. Well, as I said in the slide, you want to look at similar books and see what categories they're listed in. And you want to start to make a list of those categories and narrow it down to three categories for each edition of your book. So look up similar authors, similar books, all on Amazon have the categories listed so that you can see those. Cheryl, I published a book of short stories through Lulu on January 9th, requested global distribution. I need to contact Author Central directly to get my book added. Now, Lulu, so if you accept a global distribution, it, Lulu will put the book on Amazon, but then you go to Author Central and claim the book once it's available on Amazon. So that was just two days ago. So I would imagine you may have a few more days, but as soon as it appears for sale on Amazon, you can go to Author Central and claim it. Shana, would you include the ask for a review in a page in the back of your book? I love this question. So absolutely, Shana. So one thing I do with my books, I call it blank page fillers. So when your book is typeset and chapters start on the right, you are inevitably left with blank pages throughout the book, which is perfectly fine. But for us nonfiction writers, you may want to use that as real estate. So you could use that to maybe list your service offerings or a course you teach, or you might use my favorite saying, the best way to thank an author is to write a review of the book on Amazon and put that on the blank page. So yeah, you can definitely put that within the book. I wouldn't put it at the beginning. We want reviews from people who actually read the book. So maybe midway and again at the end is a good place to put that request. I love that question. Jacqueline, how do you get past the fact that Amazon will not let you post a review unless you bought the book from them? That should not be the case. Amazon allows book reviews if you have purchased something from that site totaling at least $50 in the last year. Best practices for getting your first 20 reviews. That's Lori, don't have a platform and go to the ads route. So conversion of ads. So think about this. If your book is in pre-sale, it can't have reviews. So I've run running ads on my pre-sale with no problem and they're converting. And ads can also lead to reviews, especially if people like the book. So your first 20 reviews, pick out your first 20 people from your tribe of influence and ask them to be your reviewers, your, your beta readers, your peers, the people who've actually seen the book. You don't want to 
ask your aunt Edna, who's going to say, oh, Lori's book's amazing, right? She's a great niece. If you want to ask people who have actually read the book, if they received an early copy and it's not a verified review, they can simply say, I received a copy of this book in exchange for my honest review. And that keeps you in line with Amazon's policies and it will keep that review from getting removed. Julia, if we're traditionally published, can we ask Amazon to edit the book description on the site and author central to change categories? Julia, as traditionally published, you can change your book description through Author Central. That's one of the many benefits Author Central offers. So claim your book on Author Central and you can go in and edit your book's page content and the description. Angela, if the book is already out, what are the best ways to collect more reviews on Amazon? Well, you can't offer incentive for reviews. So you can't offer like a bonus download or something if you go write a review. It gets back to asking, right? Ask your email subscribers, put it out on social media, reach out to people one-on-one. -on -one. Hey, I sent you a review copy. Do you have a minute to post a review? Here's the link. Make it really easy. So, you know, it's that ongoing promotion. And if people are liking the book, some reviews are going to come in naturally, right? But you want to keep the promotion wheels turning. If you get an email from a reader, you want to reply with, please post a review on Amazon. And you just want to make that part of your regular routine to be asking for reviews. There's also review services, that book review targeter software I talked about. You could do it anytime. You can be looking up Amazon reviewers, contacting them and offering them review copies even years after the book's release. There's nothing wrong with that. Deborah, can you talk about the time period where you can offer your digital book for free and will reviews by those individuals count? Publishing for visibility, not profit. So Deborah, you're talking about the Kindle KDP Select program. And I will just, with a caveat that I'm not a super fan of this program. I think it was really intended for fiction writers and it, but it basically what you have to do for those of you who aren't familiar, you enroll your ebook in Kindle Select, and that means you cannot distribute it anywhere else. It can't be available through the Apple I Bookstore, Barnes and Noble, or any other ebook directory. It can only be available through Amazon. You're giving them exclusive rights. In exchange, they allow you to do free book promos and things like that. And I think they have a limit of that of maybe two weeks. It's been a while since I've double checked those stats because I don't love that program. However, I will say if you're giving it away for free and you have some reason for doing that, just follow the terms through the KDP Select and it will tell you, but I'm pretty sure it's a two-week time frame. Denise, what are your recommendations on book length, minimum, maximum? So that's changed over the years. We're seeing a lot of shorter books and there's, I always tell writers, don't write for length, write what needs to be said. So if your book is, is short, that's probably fine. If your book is 300,000 words, that's like six books, right? So 50 or 60,000 is a typical, maybe a business book. Um, a memoirs tend to be a little longer, maybe 80,000. So somewhere under 80,000. How about that? What is an Amazon ad? Amazon ads are a pay-per-click service. And it looks like Julia's going to talk to you about that. So Amazon ads are great. They You pay per click and it's where you see those sponsored books. You can get your book there too. And again, that's a big, big topic to cover. Ruth, I have a book about brain optimization. So it's a similar audience to James Clear's, which is extremely wide, but I have no email list. How do I find my target audience and reach them? All I can say is people who want good brain function, not sure how to narrow it. Or if I do, please advise on how you would best reach. Then on off because I'm at work. People who want good brain health is not a great description of an audience. Maybe, maybe you want to brainstorm that a little bit, brainstorm, no pun intended, but people who are interested in holistic health would probably be your audience, right? People who are interested in those types of things, habits, things like that. So how do you reach them? What authors are they following? You identify James Clear, probably Gretchen Rubin, people like that. A lot of times you can target ads against people who follow those authors that can actually be done in Facebook and Instagram. But I would encourage you to narrow that down a little bit more. And I would also assume there's probably an age range there, maybe 
you know, 45 to 70, I don't know, but you might survey the people that are your current readers and ask them to help you narrow that focus down a little bit. And then it, it's about creating that content for right, them, right? So teaching them about brain health, teaching them about how to improve their habits and their lives and all the things that you do with that. It sounds like a very cool topic. Susan, you've inspired me to send out review copies. Yay. To those mentioned in the book question, I write, tell them first, right? Then ask them to please leave a review. Thanks. So this goes back to, I like to see my book in the hands of people who will talk about it. And if somebody's mentioned in your book or interviewed in your book, they want to show it off, right? So you might offer a digital copy, but it's so much more fun for them to be able to hold up the book and show it on social media or talk about it. So I am a fan of sending the physical copy. You can certainly offer a digital copy and say, hey, would you also like a physical copy? And and then fulfill those orders because you'll need their mailing address and things like that. But yeah, I would definitely email them, let them know, hey, you're featured in my book. If they don't already know, here's the link to get the digital. If you'd like a physical copy, hit reply and send me your mailing address. Mary, do you think it's a good idea to create a free day to promote to reviewers so they will show up as verified buyers, but they put your regular pricing the next day? A lot of people do ebook promotions between 99 cents and 2.99 to kind of boost those sales and get people writing verified reviews. So I'm honestly not sure if the free downloads are going to count as a purchase. I, I, I mean, there's a category for, for free, but I think you'd be better off to offer your ebook at 99 cents to 2.99 for a limited time period. Diane, how are in advance of a launch, you recommend pitching podcasts? Ooh, good question, Diane. Podcasts often have a long lead time. It can be as many as three months. So I would start at least three months ahead because what happens is you can get booked, but then you want the, it won't appear until months after your book is launched. So earlier is better, even four months. So do you get permission to send free review copies? How do you do that? Do you give people a timeline to post a review? So the review copies, there's no guarantee recipients are going to write a review or do anything with it. And you can't force them. You can't require them. Amazon won't let us give incentives. So what you do, though, is you send it out and then you ask, you follow up. So if they haven't written a review and you can usually tell because you can see your reviews publicly on Amazon, then you want to do some outreach. Reach out to those people that you sent copies to maybe two weeks later and say, hey, have you had a chance to see the book? Do you have a moment to write a review? Here's the link. Always make it easy for them. Do you think you can produce digital books while also going after a traditional publishing deal or will one harm the other? Hey, Mandy, I would, if you're talking about publishing the book as a digital edition while you're pitching that same book to publishers, I would not do that. Publishers rarely want a book that's already published unless it's taken off, right? It's a Miracle Morning, Hal Elrod book took off, the publisher would be interested. But if it's not taken off, and they see, oh, it only has three reviews or 10 reviews, and it isn't even selling well, it's actually going to hurt your chances of getting a book deal. So a whole bunch of reasons not to do it with the same content. If you have a different book and you publish that yourself and you promote it and it sells well, that's a benefit for the next book that you're going to pitch to a publisher. I hope that makes sense. Sarah, I launched my first book last year. Is there such a thing as a relaunch? Is it too late to market it like crazy now? Send out review copies, et cetera. I have a second book coming out that builds on the first. Should I advertise the first book as well as the second or stick to the second? Hey, Sarah, you can always do a relaunch and it could just be a bonus campaign. I mentioned James Clear of Atomic Habits. He did this like a, a week or two ago. He did a, a, a special promotion that if you buy the book or you've already bought the book, and you send the send that information in, they sent like three bonus chapters that were cut from the book. It was such a brilliant marketing strategy. So yeah, offer some sort of incentive for people. If they missed the book the first time, they can get it now. A second edition can also help boost sales. So maybe you change up the forward or tweak some information, or you just promote the existing book. With your next book coming out, the that typically leads to backlist sales, meaning you're Previous books will sell more copies naturally, so you can do that as well. So it just depends on the timing. If your second book isn't coming out for a while and you've got time to do a relaunch campaign, go for it. 
Absolutely. You just give some incentive, give maybe create prizes, something that's going to get people excited. Roger, to whom are book reviews assigned at Metro newspapers? If no one has that title, who should be contacted? Look at the book reviews in the paper and see who's writing them. There's usually, you'll see the writer's name. And unfortunately, most newspapers don't have in-house. Oh, you're in Rockland. So it used to be Al Leone, who wrote for the Sacramento Bee. Don't ask why I know this. I used to own a bookstore. He retired some years ago, and I'm not sure how they're handling that now. But generally, there's a byline with the uh, current book reviews. Can you talk a bit about how the marketing of your books can be continued Posthum, I can never pronounce that word. You know, oof, that, I've never been asked that question. I, it's lovely. It certainly happens for lots of writers that remain in Beloved. So I would say somebody needs to be in charge of that, maintaining a platform. Wayne Dyer comes to mind. He, he wrote a lot of kind of spiritual self-help books. I, I loved his books. I was a fan for a long time. And then and then he died a few years ago, but Hay House Books still puts out his content, promotes his books. So put somebody in charge of that. Erica, can you speak to the pluses and minuses of pitching book events at independent bookstores for those of us who have card copies available? So far, this has been very challenging. Okay, Erica, I am not a fan of bookstore signings. I have to be honest. I used to own a bookstore Average author will be lucky to sell a handful of copies at a bookstore event unless you bring the people and you heavily promote it and it, they really aren't great sellers unless you're famous or you have a reality show. So I would rather see you pitch speaking engagements because when you speak to a group and captivate an audience for 20 minutes or an hour, they want to buy your book. You will have much more success doing it that way. Maybe even start at your local library. They love to bring authors in to do speaking events. Robin, is it worth uploading a book I published in 2010, Social Media for Small Business? 2010, Robin, unless you've updated that book, social media landscape has changed dramatically. I would not publish a book that is outdated. I would not promote and publish a book that's got a lot of old content. So I would say no, unless you fully refresh that book. Is it possible to effectively brand and market books in diverse categories? As you guys expertise in many areas. So this is a struggle for a lot of us as writers. We have multiple interests, right? But it's tricky. So it, it, really what I recommend is pick a lane and try to stay in that lane. And if you're, so if you're writing about, you said dogs and speaking, right? You almost have to create two separate platforms, two separate sets of social media, certainly two email lists, two, two of everything, I used to do a lot of small business consulting. It's where I started and I had a blog for small business. And then I was slowly working with authors and I became a publisher and I thought, I don't want to straddle two genres any longer. So I let go of my small business content books, all of it, and just decided to stay on one path. So it's up to you how much you can, you can manage. But if you don't have a logical crossover, it's not easy. Jane, is Ingram Spark good in addition? In addition to what was that Lulu? I'm not sure I fully understand that question, but I would say Ingram Spark is a good, generally a good self-publishing service, print on demand service. Rachel, what is your feeling about hiring a publicist? My first book came out at the beginning of the pandemic and all the things publishers, publicists did fell through. I mean, I have mixed feelings about publicity. I do not believe every author's book warrants hiring a publicist. It's very expensive. You will almost never earn back the, your investment in book sales. So you want to think about that and really be sure that hiring an official publicity firm, and I'm talking about the ones that are $25 or $3,500 a month is a typical publicity fee. If you're trying to get major media to impress clients and things like that, there might be a reason. But hiring a virtual author's assistant is such an affordable way to get some book marketing going that I would almost always recommend that. If you have a, if you don't have a big budget, John, for your first book, what are reasonable expectations for a successful launch? Number of books sold, John, in the lifetime of a self-published book, this is a sad statistic. Most, most authors won't sell 300 copies. So I would say if you want to set a goal for your first book, try to sell 300 copies in the first two years and you'll be ahead of the pack. 
Um, but otherwise it's just so variable how many books you'll sell. Sue, what advice do you have for having a successful in-person launch party? Well, those are fun. And I've been to all kinds of book launch parties. I've been in bookstores. I've been at bars. I've been at restaurants. I think those can be a lot of fun. It's a great way to get photos, invite your peers, your friends, anybody local out to support you. So one author I worked with years ago hired a band and put them outside of the Barnes and Noble and then had a registration table for people to get on his email list. And then inside he was speaking like every 30 minutes, he gave a 10 minute talk. It was genius. He sold a lot of books that day. That's very different from just showing up at a bookstore, sitting at a table and hoping people buy your book. So you definitely want to engage people with the book for sure. And invite as many people as possible. What are your top suggestions for authors who have decided not to list on Amazon and just go a D to C? Claire, that's tricky. You really have to find maybe bulk book sales. I don't know anything about your book or your audience, but not selling on Amazon is extremely limiting from a consumer perspective. So you're going to have to really get niched focus and maybe advertise in magazines, trade associations, things like that. That's a, definitely going to be an uphill battle. What would be an ideal target for book sales and reviews in the first three months? So the similar question, Genevieve, it just really depends. But I would say in general, aim to sell 300 books. You'll be ahead of most self-published authors if you do, sadly. Peg, my book was published in 2019. Will these strategies work for a book? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Beta readers might be the only thing that don't really doesn't really apply to a book that's already published. What do you think of taking a manuscript that has been edited with a professional to the publishing services that take on all the development of the final book and marketing? Dave, every book needs multiple rounds of editing. So if you, even though you've already had some editing, hiring another firm that also does editing is never a bad thing. I, I really recommend at least three rounds of editing on any manuscript. And that gets to be the most expensive part because editing is labor intensive you said to leave article on website for Google to index it and then put on social media sites. I like, I link to my newsletter articles on Facebook when I email them. Sometimes I put them on my website. Do we need to switch to order? Yes. So this gets back, Patsy, to putting your content on your own site and driving people to your site. You want them to see your other content. You want them to see your book promotion. They want They want them to see you know, who you are. So uh, certainly always focus on your own real estate before social media real estate. Yeah, the chat will be saved, Mary. Thank you. And that will be shared with the recordings this afternoon. Okay. Did I get it all? My designer plans to use Squarespace for website. Is that advisable? Squarespace is, a, is okay. I wouldn't say it's my favorite. It's a great starter website. If you're just going to write one or two books and not going to spend the next three decades building an online platform, Squarespace is probably fine. But if you are, if you're building a career around your book or something like that, you probably want a more traditional WordPress site. But for starters, it's fine. Joel, interested in comment about Substack versus Medium? What's your opinion? Does anyone else have any experience? So Medium does, it seems to have lost some popularity just from my sense of what's happened there. That's a free platform where you can post articles and potentially get paid based on views. Substack seems to be hot right now. These things come and go. That's exactly why I said Medium was hot a year or two years ago, and now it's kind of fizzling out. And Substack's hot right now, but it might be fizzling in a year or two. We just can't predict, unfortunately. Lisa, I published a book for new dog owners and I'm having a hard time post-publication staying positive. The book is called Noses in the Wind, How to Create the Best Life for Your Dog and Make a Forever Home. It is so overwhelming. I'm on Amazon and BNN. I suck at social and I'm over 50. Hey, I'm over 50. You can do this. Yeah. Feel it's a youth culture with all the social buzz and whistles. Yeah, Lisa, you need to become the dog expert, right? The dog owner expert and your dog's best life. Dog content gets shared more than anything else on social media. I think I read that somewhere. Even if it's just a little quote from your book with your book title on there. So you can do this. I would create a hub on your website, create some content about dog care, attract that audience, 
and being over 50, I'm over 50. It is not an excuse. We can all do this, but I know it's overwhelming. So bite off those three bites at a time or plant three seeds at a time, bit by bit, but you want to drive people back to your website and be the dog care expert. What format do you send beta readers? I think we address that. Typically it's a PDF of the book. Do you convert full email lists, everyone I've ever met to subscribers? No, Diane, you actually cannot do that. It violates, it's called the CAN Spam Compliance Act. So you need to, it's, you need to have had some sort of business relationship with these people or you need them to opt in. So you need to ask those people to opt into your list. And I think there's a way that you can upload and ask to opt in through MailChimp or Constant Contact. You would need to um, check their support for that. But technically, you can't just create an email list and start hammering everyone you've ever met, unfortunately. Jason, how do you how do we get from the nonfiction logo on your book? I'd like to indicate my affiliation with your nonfiction community. Jason, are you talking about the member logo. If you're a member of the association, Jason, we have the logo available for download on the member um, homepage on the site. And if that's not it, email us at help at nonfictionauthorsassociation.com and we'll help you. I'm not sure if I'm understanding that correctly. Why don't I like KDP Select? Because I don't like giving Amazon exclusive distribution to my work. I want my eBooks available on all other platforms. So that's it. I think it's another one of those kind of monster games that Amazon plays, trying to get exclusive distribution for eBooks. Used to get a lot of Amazon sales and I'm competing with used bookstores, trying to update my Seller Central site, but Amazon doesn't recognize me. I mean, you have to contact Amazon support for, for Author Central stuff and used bookstores. They're just always going to be there. So just keep your marketing wheels turning, come up with fresh ideas, things like that. Is it good or bad idea to mention if you mention a person or their company in your book and let them know you're doing this and ask if you can send them a copy when it's ready for publishing so that you can get a review type endorsement. Don't do that for reviews, Ruth. In the natural course of writing a book, you might refer to a, a company you recommend or an author or have a real world case study. I do all of that. I definitely let people know prior to the book publishing that, hey, just wanted you to know you're, I'm mentioning you in the book, check it out. But don't do it just to get endorsements back from them. They won't all even do that anyway. And that's not the purpose of that. It's more about just enriching your content in your book. Any tips on writing a great, a great Amazon author page? Yeah, A plus content is one way to do that. Certainly longer book descriptions. That's a big question, Christy. It is covered in the new book and in depth in our course, but that's that's a big question. But it is really about connecting with your reader, get putting really good looking descriptions up there and things like that. Adding audiobooks, Susan, great idea. Audiobooks are the largest growing segment of the publishing industry right now. So if your book can be made into audio, I think it's absolutely worth it. Fred, if I published a book eight months ago and there have already been major advances on the topic, am I better updating the book or creating a second edition? I, I would probably create a second edition, Fred, because that gives you an excuse to go do another big launch and promotion. And it's exciting when a book says second edition, it tells me there's new content there versus it was just revised. Dorinda uh, used to get a lot of Amazon. Oh, sorry, error. Okay, we're almost there. If book was originally published 10 years ago, but reprinted, does the newer date count or the original date? The original copyright date would count. So I'm not sure I fully understand that question, um, but you have a published by date on Amazon and then you have the book's original copyright date, unless it's a second edition, like we just mentioned, then you could have a fresh copyright date. Memoir, trilogy, do I only promote book one or do I promote the trilogy? Ah, trilogies, uh, Rosanna, perfect question to end on because that's what KDP Select is meant for, our series of books. Typically, that's romance and mystery. And what you would do is you would put the first ebook on free, the free promotion, the free giveaways with the goal of if they like book one, they go and buy books two and three. So I hope that makes sense. You guys, this was amazing. We've been at this for an hour and a half. I haven't even seen the chat. I see it's very loaded, but 
I love your questions. This was great. We've got to wrap it up because Zoom's going to cut us off at the 90 minute mark. But I want to say thank you so, so much for being here today. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you have some new ideas to take away. And I'd love to see many of you in our course starting next week. And I just really appreciate your participation. Thank you all so much. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for listening to this webinar hosted by the Nonfiction Authors Association. Members enjoy full access to replays of all of our educational webinars and many other benefits. Not a member yet? Think about it. We offer tremendous support, guidance, educational resources, courses, free reports, and a welcoming community for you, wherever you are in your writing and publishing process. We also produce the annual Nonfiction Writers Conference offered entirely online since 2010. Find out more about the NFAA and how to join at nonfictionauthorsassociation.com.